everybody and welcome back to another episode of the nerd gen report i'm your host pablo and joining me as always is mr brian shows before we begin i'd like to give a shout out to my wife she just completed her edd um she was working very hard uh, there were some nights it was hard for me to get a show in because she was you know busy and um but she you know she stuck it in and she finally finished and so congratulations to her right. brian there is a lot to talk about man a lot happened last weekend and throughout the week we've got some news we got the debut of moon Knight, which brian i can't wait to have a conversation about that mm -hmm. because i finally sort of um understand when beast in the x-men when he says fascinating <laughs> For those of you who know what I'm talking about, you don't mean the Kelsey Grammer beast. By no, the way. no, 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 For no. People no. at all who are the not X familiar with the yeah. real beast. Yeah, X, X, the X Men animated series, Henry McCoy. Um, which, by the way, there's some episodes of him that are just wonderful, man. You, uh, if you ain't up on it, you gotta watch it. If you haven't watched it in a long time, rewatch it because it's a good watch. Brian, let's we're gonna talk a little bit about the Oscars. We ain't gonna get into a whole crazy discussion about that, but um, we'll talk a little bit about that. We have Morbius. Listen, Brian, you and I have discussed this for a while, and we were never too confident about this. It looked good, but then you hear all the stuff the director's spoiling it before the movie's released. So it tells that tells you something just to get you to go see it. So we already knew what was happening there. Um, a little bit of insight into uh, um, Bruce Wayne, the, uh, the Batman director, on, uh, was, was discussing what they were attempting to do with the character of Bruce Wayne, and we've and there's something that we've talked about um, uh, a lot about in, in our previous discussions. So you can certainly take a look at that. But we'll we'll touch a little bit on that. Um, I'm telling you, man, this guy Ezra Miller. I don't know. We'll get into that, Brian, because it's like you just this this sort of stuff you just don't sweep under the rug. Um, she Hulk post production issues. What's that about? Is this the same sort of excuse? Is this is, this is becoming the dog ate my homework type stuff? It's an excuse to cover up the real reason why there are issues. Um, Brian, you texted me, Top Gun. I looked at that trailer and I was like, yo, I can't. See, I do more than go crazy over superhero films and get excited about wanting to go see a movie. But to go see a movie like this, visually, sound, the story, the, the cat, Everything looks just wonderful about this movie. I can't wait to see it. I'm sure you feel the same. Um, Blue Beetle. We got another uh, cast announcement. Um, Sharon Stone, Brian, I don't know how you feel about that, but we'll get into that. Uh, Loki season two is not, uh, I'm pretty sure most people who are who have been up on it uh, uh, know that the, the, the showrunner, was she the showrunner, showrunner and director of Loki? uh direct she was the director she actually behind okay. the camera yeah okay um she's no longer there she wanted to move on she did her thing there and just wanted to do something different you can't you can't hate on that you know you gotta respect that and the people who are who did a couple of episodes of moon Knight, is it uh more than a couple but yes they're the, they're the writers of not the okay. not the director yeah okay so they're going to be working on loki season two Listen, if Jonathan Majors isn't Clubber Lang, I'm just gonna go see Cl Jonathan Majors. I don't even really get into much of Creed 2. Creed 1 was pretty good. Um, Creed 2, I wasn't too um, excited about that. I saw, I saw it, but you know, it's not a rewatchable movie for me. Um, so I'm hoping that Jonathan Majors uh, is, is who I think or we think he is. Uh, an announcement, something that I probably forecasted quite some time ago, 
<laughs> I'm not going to go back to the videotape because I don't got that kind of time, but you surely can go um, and just rewatch our shows. If you haven't watched it, go watch them. That I mentioned a long time ago that I hope that we get a Voltron. That's it. It's why, why, why shouldn't we? And now we finally got that announcement. But Brian, I'm a little bit worried about the director. Yeah, we'll I talk agree. about that. I agree. And then we'll get into Moon Knight, man. It was a fascinating episode, and I can't wait to discuss that. First up, Oscars. Brian, let's first get this out the way. Dune won six Oscars. For all the categories, you, it's like, do you remember who else was up? I don't. I know. I just knew that Dune was going to win visual effects. What were the what were the uh, wins for Brian? So the wins uh, they were nominated for ten, including Best Picture. We knew they really didn't have a realistic shot at that. Um, controversially, Denny Villeneuve was not nominated for Best Director. He should have been, um, but it did win for visual effects, cinematography. Greg Fraser. We talked about him on the Batman recently. He's got another Oscar in his bag. Best production design, can't argue that. Best film editing, that's an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Best sound, can't argue that at all. We talked about this with the Batman for next year. I think Dune is a movie that I saw on HBO Max, but when the minute I saw it was sort of like, man, I wish I had gone to the theater instead because I feel like the sound was, was spectacular. Yeah. Um, and it did also win for best original score. Now, Hans Zimmer is probably alongside John Williams, the, the greatest living kind of composer of film music. And so he, pretty much anything he writes is gonna get nominated, but this was a pretty distinctive uh, piece of music. So he he also won. So six wins for a, you know, what's still a blockbuster movie. Uh, it's a yeah. pretty big deal. And so I think it elevates the expectation for part two. What it says to me, Pablo, is that if part two is a level up from part one, it's yeah. not impossible, best picture, best director. Not impossible, because think about, remember when uh, Lord of the Rings came out? They nominated Fellowship for everything. They nominated Two Towers for everything, but they saved the best picture win yeah. for Return of the King. I, not ruling out. I still think it'd be a long shot, yeah. but if it's better than the first, with this in hand, they will be at the table. Yeah. I, it took me a little while to watch it the first time around, but then uh, I think it was on the other day and I started watching it and it's like, it's just, when you see a, a scene of it, you're just engaged and you're watching it like in awe how beautiful it is and, and you want to watch this movie. You, it's not an unwatchable movie. No. And um, so I'm glad it did what it did and I'm looking forward. When that movie ended the first time around, I, I, I was certainly anticipating the next one i'm thankful that it is getting a, a second run i didn't think there was any doubt that that would be it if, if it would have been like if it wouldn't have made a lot of money maybe it doesn't get made but i think it made decent money and they think they'll make more probably on the second one because of this, these wins yeah and the second one won't be a day and date as well yeah yeah so that also exactly. yeah um flash Real quick, I just want to discuss that because it was one of the cringiest moments of the Oscars. It's one bizarre. of them. <laughs> <It's bizarre. laughs> yeah, I mean, on a, on a night where the bizarre became the norm. Yeah. And, you um, know, <laughs> there were other yeah. bizarre, and this was one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was just, uh, it was a cringy moment no way in my mind when i was watching them run down the the like the the winners or whatever uh because it was like what top five right yep and you see no way home you see endgame uh what were the others do you remember so the the official category was the oscars fan favorite cheer movie moment. moment yeah it was a cheer moment okay so um the other so you had and, and this was not specific to 2021 right this this actually went back to your point end game was 2019 no yeah. way home 20 
uh, and, and Justice League, uh, Zack Snyder's Justice League were in the same year, but then you actually had the original Matrix. So way back when oh. from uh, Neo in bullet time on, yeah. the, on the roof. And then they had a scene from Dream Girls as well. Uh, so those were kind of the five counted down. And, and then even within Zack Snyder's Justice League, they honed in on where the flash enters the speed force, that specific effect and moment, which I don't even think is the best effect in the movie. I actually think it's one of the ones I probably didn't love as much, but that's the one they yeah. put up. And that was in fact a winner. That, that, that was unbelievable to me. Um, but it, I, hopefully they learn from this and listen, if they put out these polls, man, for us who know, let's show up, man, because the people that voted will obviously <laughs> restore the side of her. That's yeah. who voted. Twice and three times. <laughs> you know, so come on, let's just show up with because that that was just horrible. Um it led to, and then incidentally, it immediately led to Ray Fisher tweeting out that he wanted another apology from Walter Hamada because he was now part of an Academy Award winning project. It reminded me of, uh, I, I when I was a kid, I listened to Big Pun, and there was a line that he used in one of his songs. He's like, not you again, go that way. That That's the exact feeling. It's like, come on, again, yo? But in like, fairness to Ray, that's what happens when you have this happen at the Oscars, right? Yeah. The Oscars dredges up this, <laughs> and then you get that. <laughs> it's like... I'm telling you, man, that that he 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 just honest. We've already spoken about it. We understand what he wants, but he's not going to get it from these guys. Maybe perhaps someday in the future, who knows, with different management or whatever, if they want to go that route. But as long as the people that are there right now, which is going to change, let's see what happens there. Yeah. Right. Um, but we need to move on. Um, it just seems like a very on. I realize the Oscars is constantly now trying to redefine itself because of the yeah. falling ratings yeah and but speaking of ratings just, we'll talk about that yes but this just seemed like a reach you know it just seemed like a very on oscars for it seemed like an overthought moment right you've had this movement to create the popular movie oscar right the 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 way for a film like no way home to or endgame to get recognition without being in the kind of best picture, you know, works of art piece of it. Why not do that? Why, why are we doing this? Yeah. Why, why are we fan voting a single moment? Can we just vote for No Way Home and Dune? Or I mean, Dune, I guess, was in this, but Dune could be in both categories. Yeah. Can we just vote for them in their own category as like best blockbuster? Is that okay? Yeah, like can yeah, we set yeah, a yeah. threshold for money and yeah. budget and say these are films are eligible to be voted on as blockbuster films. And can we just vote for that? Like, why, yeah. why do we have to get into like 20 years of random moments, which, you know, the Oscars is supposed to be an, an homage to film history. Yeah. Like these five moments don't, to me, don't capture 20 years of film history. Like no. there's a lot in between, a yeah. lot in between yeah. that I would put above this yeah, or yeah. alongside it that would be in this case so that's why it just it just felt like it didn't fit it's true and then yeah, like of the course. fact that you know, it was in a weird way the flash winning and Zack Snyder's Justice League winning was kind of fitting because it was like that's a film that by definition didn't fit right that's kind of <laughs> why it, it wound up being what it became and, and and so that's it's it's just the whole thing weirded me out even before we got to yeah the ultimate sort of you know, thing that wound up trumping everything else we've just, I mean, there's probably people tuning in that are like, wait, there were actually other parts of the Oscars that night? If you tuned in at that exact moment, you would not have known that you were watching the Oscars. No, I agree. You'd have been like, this is the Saturn Awards or the MTV Movie <laughs> Awards. Exactly. Um, and then, obviously, um, what happens, happens with that. Everybody's talking about, I don't really want to get into it, but what I think should happen I think it would be perfect. Oscars want ratings. Chris Watt can have a, a, a nice big payday. He hosts the Oscars next year. Oh, goodness. That is the ultimate. You want your ratings up? You do that and have Chris Rock have free reign. It, that's a done deal in my book, Brian. 
Your thoughts wow. That is, well, I, it's funny. You are the first person I've heard mention this. What a, I mean, I agree with you on the, on the rate. First off, the ratings were up 50% as they were, which is interesting because a lot of people didn't realize in real time what had happened, right? We, the, the, the world broke this news on social media kind of through international telecast because the U.S. telecast was somewhat edited. So you didn't really see the full effect of the slap heard around the world and all the aftermath. Yeah. But you're right, actually. Considering Chris Rock actually successfully hosted the Oscars. Oh, yeah. And, you know, didn't pull his punches in that. I mean, that was obviously a very, you know, very, a, a very thematic Oscars, if you will. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, you're, and, and now that Will Smith has, at least for the time being, resigned from the Academy, I don't really know. That doesn't strike me as a lasting thing, but um, that's what's happened. Yeah, no, you're right. If they did that, I mean, people would be showing up for those first six, seven oh, minutes, that's for sure. Forget about it. The ratings would be off the roof if they do that but let's see what happens man because chris rock he's sitting on it he's saying one-liners here and there but he's not really talking about it yet we're taking the high road in oh, his yeah. stand-up shows he's had fans removed for actually heckling will smith and he's kind of like nah i'm not having that in my show he's had people so yeah. he's not he's not bringing the material yeah yeah, yeah. but you know it's I can coming i can just see chris rock at the oscar saying I got two words for, for, for Will Smith. Thanks, Will. <laughs> Forget about it, yo. That 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 is that is you cannot pass up this opportunity. Can it, can I loop this back to superhero for a second though? Because we just had that rumor mill about Jaden Smith maybe being Miles Morales oh. being something. Do you yes. think that Will Smith killed that for him? Absolutely. I agree. I think I think especially, especially after his son his tweeted out yeah, exactly. afterwards. Exactly. I think they're a little toxic right now for, exactly. from, from that standpoint. Exactly. You can sleep better at night for those guys out there who weren't really happy or were concerned about this possibility. I don't think it's going to happen. And listen, again, Jaden Smith can do static shock or something else, but not this, not this. And, and I think Will has killed that uh, possibility. Um... Let's talk about uh, Morbius for a second. Brian, we've seen the reviews. Ooh. We've seen the director spoil the movie, the, the end credit scenes, and people talk about it. And for the most part, everybody's in agreement that this is perhaps the worst post credit scenes ever in the last 20 years. Brian, if you're Marvel, you're Kevin Feige and you're looking at this and me as a fan, do you think Kevin will intervene or do you think he'll let it play out and let the fans such as myself say, we don't want these characters over in Sony's hands. We want them back into the MCU. We're not going to watch anything you do. Because this right here, Andrew Garfield is not going to feel really confident about what they're able to do with this. If he wanted to come back, perhaps not even told him why. Perhaps maybe they'll have to pay him a, a hell of a lot of money to do it. But I don't think they will. Your thoughts? I think it's the latter. Um, so the way I understand Kevin Feige's involvement with the Sony Spider-Verse is that he really pretty much has been working on the Tom Holland spider That's Tom Holland Spider-Man. That's predominantly where he has a voice because he obviously has a vest. That's the only character that is truly crossed over, right? That's the character that's appeared in the MCU. I'm not aware that he's been involved in the production of Morbius in any meaningful way, or Venom, for that matter, even though Venom was a box office success. I'm not aware that he was a storyteller or any sort of sounding board for ideas for any of those movies. It's only been Tom Holland's development as Spider-Man that he's been involved in. Mm -hmm. So I think Sony's kind of on its own for, for these. And... 
Marvel has the advantage position, meaning Disney Marvel has the advantage position of kind of letting them audition, right? And sort of say, Tom Hardy probably passed the test, right? His character, regardless of what the critics thought, 30% for the first one, 58% for the second one, Rotten Tomatoes, audiences generally liked the movie. Wasn't, you know, audience cinema scores for Venom and Venom 2 were like B+. Plus. Like, okay, like not amazing, you know, not, not Avengers Endgame, A+, plus, but, but not Morbius C+. Plus. Mm-hmm. Morbius C+, plus is about as low as you ever see for this genre. Um, and so I think we talked about this when Sony set this course. I still maintain they got away with it on Venom, that they didn't make a great movie either time. But something about the way Hardy portrays Eddie Brock. Which for me, in my opinion, is getting old, but go ahead. I I agree with you because it didn't really evolve from picture one to picture two. Something about that worked on a wide scale with audiences, right? There's 800 million a box of the first one and whatever was 600 at the second one, even with COVID that kind of says people bought into what Tom Hardy was selling. But for all intents and purposes, they've made the same caliber of movie now three times. The only difference with Morbius is that the Jared Leto character is not resonating with audiences. And so you're seeing a projected opening box office weekend of about 40 million, but with a cinema score of about C plus, that's going to collapse. So you might see 40 million become 12 million, 14 million a second week. So that means even with with a production budget of 75 million, this movie is going to struggle to be profitable. And as we've said, you, you can't just keep firing D minus product at, at, at the, and build a successful universe. It doesn't work that way. There's a certain level of competence you have to stay above to build a shared universe. Of course. Brian, are you excited to see Craven? I wasn't excited too much, but even more now? I is like... We're... I... <sighs> Listen, but they listen, haven't listen. made that's the thing like without take this take the tom holland trilogy out because you know that the marvel guy, the disney marvel guys were in the room helping them make it take that out the three movies that you're going off of right now are the two venom movies and this where this where where are they inspiring confidence i get that they have venom box office but don't tell me that's a great movie it's not it's not so how are we getting to Craven? How are we getting to Madam Web? How are we getting to whatever Sinister Six? How? You have to be able to do better than this. They're, they're, they're single-handedly ruining that universe, man. Like this, this is a these scores and this type of response is a material step down from anything that DC put out. Is the kind of All stuff spade that, spade. It, 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 it is the kind of stuff that 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 starts this fatigue thing, and there are people who have just like I don't want to see a Marvel movie anymore, you know. Despite how good things still are, and and despite you know people will still want this uh, genre as long as they give us good stuff. But this is the kind of stuff here that Marvel has his name attached to it. Well, they don't have a choice, um, right? Sony yeah. has those rights. Yeah. Well, I, could, but, I think we can safely say no Morbius 2. That's not happening. Nah. That's a wrap. So that is and a solo. Ja- and, and Jared Leto needs to move on and do some other stuff, some stuff that he's good at. Not this. He's done with the superhero genre. He I was just about to say, I was thinking about the same thing. Well, like, there's a, I was, th- th- um, there's a line in Tombstone, one of my favorite Westerns, where like Val Kilmer is talking to Stephen Lang and he goes, maybe poker's just not your game, Mike. And I'm like, I felt that way about Jared Leto. It's like, you did the Joker, you did Morbius. Maybe the superhero thing's not your not game. Your thing. Yeah. Yeah, right? Yes, I agree with you 100%. Man. I was thinking about it, yo, that he got to let this go. He won an Oscar. Like this guy knows how to act. But this genre has not... Matched well with his talents so far. 
So, Brian, um, before we move on, I mean, what happens now? I mean, because this is this is like this is what I was dreading. I was hoping that you know the Marvel MCU team will be helping along Sony so that they could keep these universes um, in in good standing and. But it seems like Sony is doing their own thing. And we're getting subpar stuff, man. Because you, like... know you, you know you know what I wanted to see? I wanted to see Tom Hardy's Venom against Spider-Man because I wanted to see the 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 the, the Eddie Brock that hates Spider-Man. And Tom Hardy know how to hate in the movie. You know, <laughs> so I wanted to see that dynamic. This he hated Spider Man. Was gonna come for Spider Man. I wanted to see that, and now I don't. I I doubt that we see, we see it. I don't know. I don't know what we're gonna see, but something's got to change, man. Well, the thing too with with both Venom two and this movie is we know from Venom two that when it comes to post credit scenes, they don't have to consult with, it's not like Sony has to call Disney and say, hey, we're gonna do this, are you okay with it? Mm -hmm. So the Venom 2 sequence was interesting because you obviously had Tom Hardy, spoiler alert, Tom Hardy is basically shifted within the multiverse and then it looks like he pops up in kind of the Earth 616 with Tom Holland, Spider-Man. And No Way Home, spoiler alert, kind of sort of like reverts him while leaving a little bit of the symbiote behind. So it was kind of like you know, they're hedged a little bit. But it almost made this feel of like Sony had this big like, oh my gosh, Hardy's like he's joining the spider. He might even be in No Way Home. And then he sort of was, but then wasn't because the, that credit scene sent him back to the Sony-verse. I was to so this movie tried to do the, the same. Film. So this movie tried to do the same thing. And it, what, what I'm wondering is, is there a little bit of, you know, kind of pettiness going on where like Sony's trying to keep sending the message that our people are in your universe and Marvel just keeps writing scenes. Disney keeps writing scenes to say, no, they're not. Not yet. You're not official yet. Yeah, man. Let us know in the comment section below um, what you guys think. I'll have more for you. I'm actually going to go see it for the two of us, and I'll I'll, I'll report yeah, back. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'll but wait. I know that's why we're not spending time on it this morning. Yeah, I'll time. wait till it's on TBS with commercials. Uh, I'll wait for that, but I'm not going to watch it when it comes out on stream. I'm just not going to make time for something that I know that's going nowhere. It's not going anywhere. Um, Ryan, let's just let's quickly discuss um a little about the uh, Matt Reeves uh. Uh, uh, Bruce Wayne that he created in the Batman and what we sort of thought already that this is going to change this is not staying this way um, this this is we are on the beginning of the journey of what Batman needs to be and um, in an article by Heroic Hollywood um, uh, Matt Reese talks about that Brian what were your thoughts on, on uh, or are you um, somewhat more excited to see what they do with that character in the next installment of the Batman. So to summarize the article, he was specifically asked about Robert Pattinson's portrayal of Bruce Wayne, which admittedly was very limited because there weren't there, you know, if you, if you've seen the movie, there aren't that many pure Bruce Wayne scenes, let alone yes. Bruce Wayne lines in the movie. Yeah. It's much more Batman centric. Mm -hmm. And Reeves basically addresses this and says that's by design, right? It's the idea that he's figuring as he's figuring everything out one thing he has not actually figured out at all is how to adopt a bruce wayne facade and use that persona to further his goals as the batman which completely fit our theory of having seen the movie of why pattinson out of the mask kind of sounds and moves and acts pretty similar to how he does in the mask because he hasn't learned yet yes. to differentiate and hasn't attributed any value. We see that in the film repeatedly. He doesn't attribute value 
to what's happening in the real world when he's not Batman. Yeah. As evidenced by when Alfred bring, wants to bring the people by the mansion. He's like, why are the, why are the Wayne people here? Why, why do I care? Yeah. You know? He hasn't learned to understand it. So it just makes me excited because we said the promise of this trilogy, the way it was framed, is that Bruce and Batman are the most interesting characters in the universe. How they evolve, how they develop, what they become over the next two pictures is the most exciting aspect and in some ways the most dangerous and risky of how this trilogy is going to be viewed over time. But everything Matt Reeves says just vibes well with, I think, us because we're like, he gets it. He gets, and you just get the sense of like the character was shown to you in a very, very specific designed way with no detail left unattended to. Yeah. So we'll see. But I can't yeah. wait to see. I mean, yeah. what do you think? I can't wait to see Pattinson's version of oh yeah, effectively a false Bruce Wayne. I can see him without, at a, without the mask at a party. And then we see something that um, we barely saw the first one. He did it once when he smirked about the cufflinks. Um, he's going to put on that smile and that charm. But I, and I think that's great because I think there's also going to be a piece of his Bruce Wayne evolution that's true nobility, right? Because he is outright disrespectful to Alfred and to other people in the movie. Yeah. And so he does need to learn that isn't a facade. You need to learn that aspect of humanity, right? So, yeah. but then, you know, when you see him in something like Tenet or even in like Good Time, he has that ability to be really suave and like really kind of, you know, so like, is he going to pull that play? Is he going to go down? I'm just fascinated to see the, yeah. the sides of Pattinson that we get. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let us know in the comments section below. I mean, for those of you who had an issue with that uh, part of the, the movie in with regards to Bruce Wayne, um, again, it was done for, for a reason. And I think you'll appreciate it more if when we see the second one um, and how that turns out. Um, next up, Ezra Miller, man, was like, yo, I, first of all, I didn't like him as Barry Allen in the first place. Um, he was better in the uh, the, the Zack Snyder cut. He was yep. better, a, a little better in that. But uh, this guy has issues. Um, and WB, I think right now is scrambling to understand what they're going to do with the Flash movie. Do Brian, let me ask you, you're sitting in the chair and you're making these decisions. Um, there's a delay, right? Full year, yep. Going to Full June year. 2023 from this summer. You have to ask the question, is that by design because of this? Are they giving themselves time, Brian, to reshoot? Do you reshoot Brian or do you keep the movie as, as is? I, I would I would think that because they have this much time, we're doing reshoots, Brian. So let's recap where we are with, with Ezra Miller, X the performance, why we're asking this question. So on the night that the Flash, the Flash, who he played, wins this Oscar moment, best moment, best fan moment for entering the Speed Force. Um, Ezra Miller is arrested in Hawaii for basically, you know, public intoxication, disorderly conduct, you know, was really kind of messing things up, I guess, at some local establishments. And, and then we come to find out this was actually the 10th, you know, he was a, not 10th arrest, but the 10th complaint Wait. about his behavior in Hawaii. A couple there obtained a restraining order against him. Apparently he entered their home at one point. I, uh, with details are limited on that. But rewind the clock. Remember, this is also a guy who's had several very public run-ins with fans. He had that one incident on tape where he appeared to choke out a fan and it never was totally clear. Like, was the fan in on the joke or was this yeah, real? Yeah. But, you know, it, it's a pattern at this. There's enough bad headlines around this guy that 
there's a lot of questions. So, yeah. you know, we, we, we try to assess the performance. I think our, our consensus view is as to why we don't like him is he, it's as the flash is that he seems to be trying too hard uh, a lot of the time. And he's at his best actually in Zack Snyder's Justice League when he's a little more serious and a little more toned down. Yes. But where I struggle, and I'd kick it back to you, it's like WB's in this weird place where they've done a lot of things and gone out of their way in a lot of ways to kill the Snyderverse. But they've opted to retain this guy as if he's a centerpiece. And in fact, the Flashpoint has been marketed as the centerpiece film by which they will kind of reroute the Snyderverse into these new directions. So my number one question is, why him? Like, I understand why they, like, if, J like, if Jason Momoa or Gal Gadot was doing the same exact stuff, it wouldn't make it any more right or any more awesome. But you could sort of see the studio saying, we got to give longer leash to the stars that have given us, that have made us more money than anybody else. Why are we treating Ezra Miller like he's that? He's never anchored a film, a solo film. The supporting character roles he played in the DC verse generally have not been favorably received nor have made a ton of money. And it's not like outside of the comics verse, this is Leo DiCaprio, right? With this sort of this unassailable reputation as a thespian, right? Where you're like, you put up with a lot of angst and diva and what, not that DiCaprio is, but just that idea that if you're good enough, you can kind of get away with a lot more. I don't get it. They treat him like a franchise player, even as they're trying to kill the universe that he came from. And then he's kind of going out and doing this stuff. I'd be looking for a way out if I was new management. Oh yeah. But they've sunk a lot of money into this film, which is shot, it's done. It's not as easy to recast and redo when you're done. It can be done, but it's hard. And it costs a lot of money. It, it would put that movie to a place where you probably could have no chance of making a profit on it. If you went back, recast the actual flash, which would probably be in 90% of the scenes and reshot the whole movie. Yeah. But I, I don't know why, if I'm Discovery's management coming in, I don't know why David Zasloff is hitching his wagon to Ezra Miller for any length of time. I think they're going to take an L and do what perhaps needs to be done and, and redo a reshoot. I don't know. Maybe shelve it. I don't know. So do you, do you, do you think that the one year delay in this movie is because of concerns over yes. his behavior? I think so. Hey, we're not the, if we think we're the first ones to know about this stuff, <laughs> I was showing the background they know about. Tenth time, it does. It didn't happen in a day or two. Ten times, meaning this has been going on for some time, and perhaps even after the first or second time, they were thinking about this. Who knows? But a year out, when we were supposed to get it, when? Well, again, the movie's been shot. We've seen a trailer. They're in post, and the official reason was they need more time for the VFX shots, but like 12 months... I mean, I'm just saying, as a reference point, Wakanda Forever wrapped shooting last week. It's coming out November 11th. Like, that's not 12 months. Yeah. And that movie's had as many production delays related to COVID as any major project. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the length of time here is suspicious. Of course. It makes no sense. So I, I certainly think that it has something to do with that. Um, and perhaps new, new management is already calling some shots. Who knows? The other part of this, too, is that, you know, as I said, because if he, Ezra Miller's career to date, where he's appeared in Blockbuster Fair, he has been the third or fourth build character. So he's in the Fantastic Beast series. He's like a supporting wizard. He's the Flash but the Flash has probably been the third, fourth, fifth most important character in, in the Snyder movies that we've gotten. Now he's the anchor of this big 
project. I don't know what's going on with him, but clearly Stardom and Ezra Miller are not mixing all that well. Yeah. He's, his profile is going to be elevated significantly by this movie when he's the lead and it's being marketed and promoted. I mean, if I'm the studio, I mean, I'd have, I'd have bodyguards on this guy 24 seven because to protect the world from him, from like him. what is he going to do? Cause you can't have this guy going off on a worldwide promotional tour and doing some and doing stuff like this in plain sight. Yeah. Like that's a wrap for your film. Yeah. I, but I'd be worried as to how he would handle yeah. the increased spotlight. Yeah. But this movie kind of really kicks into high gear if it does get released as is. Yeah. Uh, it, this has yet to be determined. We don't know what's going to happen, but uh, we we do know, I, at least I feel that he, 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 he needs help and WB needs to do whatever they can to help him. Um, but you might have to take an L <laughs> on this and do a reach. I don't know, but to go with him and, you know, let's say they do release this movie and this movie is terrible. What does it do? For, what, does it make Ezra, you know, more on edge? I don't know. Yeah. That's what I was saying. Yeah, the whole process kind of scares me a little bit given yeah. where we are already. I mean, hopefully it works out, man. But hopefully he gets help, man. Hopefully, because this is this is this is not good for WB or for him. By the way, you imagine if they had gone with the if they had kept the original plan, which was to have Cyborg as the number two listed hero in this movie, with Ray Fisher's crusade and Ezra Miller's behavior, and there's maybe the movie would have done well if it was being headlined by these two guys who are just completely. <laughs> Off the reservation for different yeah. reasons. Yeah, I, people will go see what the hell this is going to look like. Yeah. What this is going to be just for that first weekend box office would be huge. <laughs> the drop off would probably be dr very dramatic. Um, we have another one that claims that there are post production issues. It's a recurring she theme these days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dog ate my homework. She Hulk. Brian, do you think that they're having post production issues, or or is this a bad series? Because we've been talking about this has been our for most people. This is not the most exciting thing Disney Plus that we're waiting for. This is at the low end, right? Um, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I would say, look, I mean, I think when Marvel started down this path of, or Disney started down this path of Disney Plus shows, I think we knew there was going to be some experimentation, which means it's going to be some busts. Like that's, that's how this works, right? That's how you grow. Yeah. You got to, you got to, you got to try stuff. And when you got your own streaming service, it's not the same as 14 years ago when Iron Man 1 comes out, you can't have that fail. That's got to work. Yeah. Everything about this show has kind of smelled of, you know, misfire. Uh, when you hear the tone, the tone, legal comedy, and a Hulk character, I don't get it. You have to really convince me. We've mm -hmm. talked about the Hulk already. I mean, we're probably at the low end of the spectrum, but has been a problematic, anyway, has been a problematic character for Marvel, right? Mm -hmm. Whether or not you like Mark Ruffalo, where they took the character or not, which I know you do not, and I mm -hmm. tend to agree with you. Mm -hmm. You know, Eric Bana, like it, it, Edward Norton, it's been a tough road for anything Hulk. Yeah. So those, to me, like that's been working against this, against this show from the beginning. It doesn't have the goodwill built up that Loki did or yeah. that, you know, Sam and Bucky did from their time in the Cap series or that Wanda and Vision did from their time with the event. All those shows had some credibility coming in because the the approval rating of the character was pretty darn high. Mm. Now, I, this show just doesn't come in with that. And when I see this, the thing that keeps going off my head is like, they've just reached a point where they've got the material, 
They don't quite know what they want to do with it. And they want to pivot something about the direction of this show. Would not be surprised to see like a major reshoot on this. Would not be surprised to see some changes. Like, you know, we're bringing in an additional director or second unit director or somebody to kind of help pick up, yeah. pick up the pieces. There. Something feels off. And it's felt off all the way through. And the teaser did nothing to make me feel different yeah. about that. And ratings with... have been, you know, for these shows, like ratings have been okay, but they, it's not like they've been like guaranteed. It's not yeah, like yeah. they just slap a show on and, and you know, five million you know people are showing up instantly to watch all the episodes. It's not working that way. Hawkeye, Hawkeye ratings were not great for yeah. a show that for most of its run was pretty good, like pretty interesting. Yeah. I think I see problems here. I see real yeah. problems, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see, man. We got to wait to see what they show us. If this, I mean, how we, we didn't get a, a certain timeline. It's just a, a delay. Did we get a, 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 a delay? No, we haven't even gotten a delay. This is that like some there's some obstacle mm. this show has encountered after the shooting of all the material and i'm i mean i jokingly sent you a message but something to the effect of are they having buyer's remorse like they're like looking at what they have and they're like we can't put this out as is we have to fundamentally change something about this to make it work for audiences that's usually not where you want it that rarely ends up being a win for the audience and for the studio no the season two <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the source of these problems comes from their issues with the Hulk. The Hulk yes. hasn't been great, and now to go off to a derivative character, yeah, that's a tough one. That's a tough little thing. And I told you, like, my biggest thing with this was because they did Professor Hulk the way they did. They usurped the thing that made She-Hulk distinctive from Hulk, which was that she retains yeah. the speaking and the mental acuity and all the human stuff while she's the, they already did it, yeah. right? We just went through this in Star Wars, right? Where they struggled with Boba because they said, this is treading too close to ground that the Mandalorian was already on. And we got an uneven output. Yeah. This is one yeah. of the things I saw with this show in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, let's see, man. Let's see. Uh, I hope it, look, if it's not going to work, I hope it really doesn't work in the hope that it recenters us on a hardcore, tough, action, fearsome Hulk. Listen, in order for the Hulk to be, I think we have to see a, a very destruction. It has to be scared. The Hulk has to be a monster an unstoppable force and it just can't be him you know fighting humans in the army we don't want to see that put, put your heroes in there i'll see that that's that's wolverine versus hulk yeah that'll work but you, if you want to go that route first you got to establish wolverine who he's going to be and how he's going to be you know if he's going to be that popular character that everybody's been waiting for you know that that that's a long road, um, but we'll see. Next up, Top Gun, Brian. You sent me the video, then you sent me a text, and and it was one word. Wow. Then I said, "Let me. I gotta look at this." So I watched it, and I was like. This is going to be so dope. If you thought the sound and Dune, if you got, if you had the, 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 the chance to see Dune in the movie theater, if you had a chance to see the Batman in the movie theater and you loved the sound design for this, this movie is going to be one of those other movies that you're like, wow, the sound design for this was amazing. And no on top visually you saw some stuff that you're like wow never seen something like this before and you know Tom Cruise does everything at 100 this is 
this is going to be a spectacle and it's going to have nostalgia. We're, we're going to have a fun time. This is what you call a fun time at the movie theaters, Brian. Your thoughts. Yeah. I mean, this was your number three movie anticipated movie for the year it was my number two. And Tom Cruise has called it a quote love letter to aviation. And I would say the final trailer, I mean, that's got that all over it. Yeah. I mean, you just, you can't miss this on a big screen. You can, you cannot. For a lot of people who are too young to have ever seen the original Top Gun, you know, in a movie theater, you cannot miss some of these scenes, like the, the scale, the detail. And I will say Joe Kaczynski, who's the director, you know, his, his, character stuff in films has always been a little bit iffy but visually his style to me is pretty impeccable so he directed um Tron Legacy he directed Oblivion with Tom Cruise um there's always style there's always purity in the way he shoots visually and like the shots they have with the cameras like on the plane and it's like this is this is what you would expect to take but with a groundbreaking film in 1986, R.I.P. Tony Scott, and bring it forward, you know, almost 40 years and show you kind of what aerial combat or air to ground combat would look like with, you know, modern, modern jets and modern technology. This is it. Like, you're not going to get any closer. And they got the support of the military again. Yeah. Oh, how are you not there May 27th or in the subsequent weeks to just feel this movie oh, yeah. i mean the characters look fine i mean like miles teller as goose's son looks perfect glenn powell as the seemingly new ice man i don't know if he's related to val kilmer but he certainly looks like he could be the way mm. they've, they've drawn but like i don't want to say who cares but there's an aspect of like who cares like they can't screw this up they have the formula from the 86 film and it's like the aerial stuff that's all i need yeah. A little nostalgia in the aerial stuff. I'm good to roll. And this movie looks amazing to me. Yeah. And, and speaking of Goose, man, and to see that confrontation and what yeah. they're selling each cool. other down. I can't wait. I can't wait. Let us know in the comment section what you guys think about this. Uh, are you guys excited for this film? Uh, I'm sure many of you guys who are fans of the original one are definitely looking forward to this. And box office prediction. I think it's big. I mean, I, you know, I think it's for a lot of people, like I said, who are too young to remember the original, like, but aerial combat is not a type of film that has been traversed very often. So this movie does stand apart. Like you look at the shots in this trailer and you're like, how many times have you seen like an F-18 Hornet flying under a bridge, you know, amidst missile fire? You don't see that. Like it's just, yeah. it's not on screen. So I definitely think, I definitely think it can hit a hundred million plus. It's Memorial Day weekend. I definitely think you can hit a hundred million plus in the opening weekend. It's not going to go. Not going to No Way Home. There, don't don't even start no, that. No, no. Not going anywhere near that. It's not going even to the Batman level, uh, in my mind. But I do think you know, hundred to one hundred and ten, hundred fifteen. But then good word of mouth. It's a it, as you said, it's an easy movie to go see. People get sucked in. Like it's going to do really well. I think it's going to do this movie. They've been sitting on this thing. It's been done for a long time, almost two years. Um, but, Half a bill? Uh, yeah, I think I think it's clear five hundred. I think I definitely think it's clear five hundred. Make move, which is, I mean, for a sequel that's thirty six years after the original, that's incredible. I know, um, right? And what a weekend, by the way. I'm just throwing this out there because you get they tweaked the Obi Wan release date, so now it's also May twenty seventh. Two episodes, by the way, not just Oof, one. Finally, this movie opens. I'm not a Stranger Things guy, but season four of Stranger Things also drops that day. Yeah. What a weekend. Yeah, I know. There's going to be a lot. It's, going to, it's, it's, it's one of those weekends. A lot to look forward to. A lot of things to see. Um, uh, whew, I might have to take... Well, do we, we have that. That's more of their weekend, right? So we That's a three-day weekend. Up. That's the only saving yeah. grace. Yeah. Interesting. But Top Gun might be a multiple times at the theater movie. Oh yeah, I think so. But the experience, I think like, so. I see think it in so. IMAX. See it in, yeah, I got, yeah. I think so. 
Uh, yeah, let us know in the comment section below uh, what you guys think of uh, uh, Top Gun and it's it's how much money you think it's going to make. Are you guys excited for it? Let us know in the comment section. Blue Beetle has cast Sharon Stone as the villain. I don't know about you, Brian, but this sort of brought it a little bit down for me. <laughs> Why? Because she was the villain in a great superhero classic 18 years ago <laughs> which which was Catwoman trust me I don't remember <laughs> you didn't even remember that all, all I remember is that basketball scene <laughs> <laughs> yo best he was yo. a villain in, in against Halle Berry yeah uh, I, I don't know, Brian. I don't know what to think about this, uh, but it's, I certainly do have concerns. Um, I don't know too much about the character that she's playing, but if there's anything like Mark Strong's villain in, in, in Shazam, then it's... Uh, I, I'm definitely going to go see it if they do decide to put it in the movie theaters. So I checked on that. Apparently that is happening. Okay. There's a flag so planted in August of 2023. And I checked because that was the release, but I checked to see was that a streaming release date or a theatrical release date? And the notes that I found most recently are that it is now a theatrical release date. So they have and this was originally it. for HBO Max, correct? Correct. Okay. So the date I don't think has changed, but they've changed the medium from streaming to and quite honestly, Sharon Stone taking the role is probably yes. a tell that they maybe have a little more budget to work with and they're going, you know, bigger, bigger name for this. Um, I'm with you. It's the first casting announcement for this movie that seemed a little off the wall and certainly very different. She actually is not playing a known character. So the reason why you don't, know the character is the characters being developed for the movie which is also sort of a eyebrow raised what are we doing here but it also makes me think then that she might not be the she might be the villain behind the villain i don't think we're going to see a blue beetle verse i don't think we're going to see joel O'Mara duena in a fist fight with sharon stone in this movie yeah but if she's pulling the strings for a more known character, maybe that's what they're trying to accomplish with this this role. And if you if you've watched Young Justice, there is a, a villain, um, uh, sort of similar in terms of exoskeleton, uh, alien uh, type of uh, character um, that's in Young Justice. That makes sense. This is one of those, like, you know, how you get Ant Man and mm -hmm. the first, if you see the first Ant Man, you, you're finding Yellow Jacket. You see the first right. Iron Man, he's finding another. This is, this one makes sense to me. Um, but let's see. That could be it, Brian. That could be a sequel to Blue Beetle. Who knows? But I don't think this is, uh, for me, it's a concern. I, I, I don't know how much of a good start this will be because of this. Let's see. Tell us in the conversation below what you guys think. You have a question? No, I was just going to say, I, I'm, I'm also curious from the Sharon Stone perspective, right? She's, I'll say she's in her mid 60s now. Yeah. I mean, I don't think there was any, I mean, you didn't even remember she was in Catwoman. I don't think there's people out there that are viewing Catwoman as any sort of like black mark on her resume. No one even remembers it at this point. Yeah. So I'm curious what made her decide from her perspective, like why does she want in on this particular project? So that has me at least a little bit curious, but I think until we, we need a few more puzzle pieces here to understand where she fits into, the, into this. When, when, when you said that, it reminded me of Michelle Five for saying that she wasn't in Greece too. <laughs> it's one of those like she still she still was working and you know she still became, you know was a big star and she denied she was in Greece too from what I heard I, that was a rumor I don't know yeah. but um let's see what happens man Loki season two the first season Loki season two was announced a long time ago it was green four season one ago. came out yeah yeah, yeah. 
and Loki season one, you and I, Brian, so I, I think I had it a little bit higher than you, but, yeah. um, Oh, no, I took an L on that one. I took a Loki yeah. size L on that, on that one. <laughs> But I was a bit excited as to what this would be um, in terms, as far as the, the the overall universe and what effect it'll have. And they certainly, uh, this this was the beginning of the multiverse here. And uh, um, they did a fantastic job. The, the the director of, she was director, correct? Kate Heron, yeah. So yes. she was, she directed all, all of the episodes. Waldron and, wrote it. Heron directed it. And it was amazing. Um, so she did that season. We were, you know, we, we were told some time ago that she was not going to continue or a while back that she wasn't going to do the second season. She has um, publicly said she was one and done from the beginning. Yeah. She was, this was not a, she ever intended to go beyond one season. I'm looking forward to seeing what else she does. Um, so now we got, um, the writers, uh, what are their names, Brian? So they're, so I checked, they did, they did do both. You were correct. So it's Aaron Moorhead and Justin yes. Benson. So they did writing and they directed episodes two and four of Moon Knight. Mohamed Diab directed episode one and is kind of the showrunner for the show. So they are taking over as the directors for loki season two so i think waldron is presumably still writing in the writer's mm -hmm. room but but mm -hmm. these two guys are going to be behind the camera and that's a good thing because i think these guys have done a fantastic job uh, with the, the um, um moon knight thus far um based on what people have said we got in the four episodes that um have been released and Loki season two, man, it has a high bar to, to cool. compete against, you know? Um, but I think the writing is what's really important here. I think the directors, um, and whomever they get to direct this uh, second season will do an equally good job with Loki season two. I'm not too concerned um on how they're moving with this yeah i think the other reason not to be concerned is that marvel has has always shown a knack for when they stumble onto creatives who are a easy to work with and b highly productive think about the russos as maybe the highest profile example of this they have shown they will shift them into prominent roles and move them around the board where they most need them so yeah. it's a huge vote of confidence when you see, we haven't even seen episodes two and four of moon Knight, but but just by seeing that they've gotten this assignment should probably raise our expectations a little bit for episodes two and four of moon Knight that we're going to see some really good stuff visually um because they're trusting these guys with the second season of what has been their most successful and most popular show to date um like what i said the russo's example they come off a community and you're like who are these guys? And then they direct Winter Soldier and you're like, these guys can do no wrong. And then they direct <laughs> Infinity War and Endgame and you're like, they really can't do any wrong. You know, so, but the genius was after the Joss Whedon experience in the first two Avengers movies, which were highly successful by and large, whatever you think of Ultron, still made a lot of money. Yeah. To hand those two guys, to keep the knowledge to say those two guys can take the mantle and push us to the next level. Mm -hmm. And now you see it happening with John Watts, right? John Watts, you're like, why is John Watts getting Fantastic Four? Spider-Man movies were fine. And then you see No Way Home and you're like, oh, right. okay. John Watts yeah. can do whatever he wants. I'm good. Yes. Yes. So yes. we see it over and over again. Yeah. So I think we're in good hands with Loki season two. Uh, I don't have any. Uh, when do you think we see it? Given its importance to the multiverse, when do you think they want to slot this? N next year. Okay. Do you think 2023? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think next year we'll see it. Late next year. Next year. Okay. Is, uh, is the hope. Um, are you guys concerned about Loki season two? Let us know in the comment section below. Jonathan Majors, I don't know if you've seen the latest <laughs> pictures of this dude, but this dude is huge. And he was already in pretty good shape in Lovecraft 
country if you've seen it. It was a, a great show. Um, he's he's jacked for this, and I've always said that we need to do something with Clubber Lang. I think this it has to be this. If it's not it, I'll be disappointed, but I'll just go want, I'll just want to go see this just to see Jonathan Majors perform because I think he's a phenomenal actor. Brian, do you think this is this is Clubber Lang? And do you feel the same? If it's not Clubber Lang, you just want to go see it to see Jonathan Majors performance. Yeah, I, I I certainly think he's a member of the Lang family. I guess you could say son, nephew. I mean, pick your Maybe they don't want to do father son every single time after doing it with Drago, but yeah, yeah. He certainly let's put it, you see the set photos where he's standing opposite Michael B. Jordan, who I don't know if he's in full creed shape, but I mean yeah. Jonathan Majors kind of looks quite imposing. Yes. And it's not like it's not like Adonis Creed was tiny in yeah, yeah. in in Creed too. And he's got a look where you're like, I it's just something about the way they got his hair cut. And like the the jawline that he's cutting, where you're like, I could see that he's related to Mr. T. Like, th and you know, I, there is that piece of that where you're like, oh, I, I buy that. And it sort of looks like he's training on his own, similar similarly to how Club and Lang trained in the first Correct. uh Rock in Rocky Three. Right. So out, out trained Rocky at the beginning of Rocky Three. <laughs> oh yeah. How he got the title. Oh yeah. yeah. So let's. Let's see, man. The hope is he's Cumberland, Lang, but if he's not, then I mean it'll be it'll be a huge disappointment, Brian. Does he keep that physique for any of the Kang variants? I think so. I mean, he looks he look, I mean, that uh, it'd be I'm fascinated to see how the Kang variants physically interact because of their power, the level of power in the in the comic book. But at some point you gotta figure he's gonna throw down with somebody. Yeah. In, on the hero side. And I wonder if he's going to be cutting a, a shape kind of like what he has in these photos because he looks looks ready to, you know, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hemsworth. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, man, let's see. Jonathan Majors, jacked. Could be, could be Lang. Could be just a new character. I <laughs> hope it's not. Let us know what you guys think in the comment section below. Just please remember to hit that like button if you're still here. Now, Brian. Yeah, we buried we buried the lead here for us, but that's all right. <laughs> Nerd Gen Report. Watch the show. Um, I've been talking about it for quite some time in the hope that somebody was listening. Not to say that they listen to me now, but I've been putting it out into the world and it finally reached somebody. We're finally getting a Voltron movie, Brian. A true live action Voltron movie. This is going to be. I... Listen, this doesn't have to be 80%, 70% on Rotten Tomatoes. If it's a 60 or 50, I'm, I'm there to see what this is going to be. Godzilla King of the Monsters was like 30. This yeah. is like that to me. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. it's like you see the godzilla fights and you're like that's what those are that's what monster fights are supposed to be on the big screen in this day and age yeah give me voltron on the robies done well i don't yeah. care <laughs> i hear you on that but you still have some characters there there's a lot of character here, i agree you know? that's fair. so you got lothor whatever you got you got a, a the, the 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 cats the individuals that that they each had their their the characteristics. Some of them were funny. Some of them were serious. There were there's some characters. Hopefully they don't look goofy. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot to play with there. There's a lot more to me anyway than just the robots. Hopefully that looks cool. But all that stuff that has to be a given. If that fails, the rest of the movie fails for me. So so Ross and Marshall Thurber. That's the moment of pause here so he's he's hot right now in the sense that he directed red notice which i didn't really care for but yeah. a lot of people watched on netflix and they're doing a second or third one he's a rock guy he's worked the reason why he did red notice is he had worked with the rock previously on several films so he fits that category for me of like 
you know, you never get a bad film, but you don't really get a great groundbreaking, innovatively shot film either. So he is directing and co-writing the script for this. That makes me a little nervous that we, we don't get the output here that we probably deserve. Is there um, a movie that he didn't do with The Rock? I have to go check. I only know him as a direct. His highest profile gigs have been have starred Dwayne Johnson. So I'm interested. And they haven't written a script. There's no script. That's the other thing. That this is not him coming on a project where they the studio signed off on a script. He's co-writing from here. So that's a TBD. Mm -hmm. I don't know about your personal views, but to me, uh, I, you know, Voltron has been reimagined several times. I know Netflix brought it back, but to me, Voltron is the 1980s. That's yeah, Voltron, yeah, yeah. Defender yeah. of the Universe. That's that's the source material to me. Did you see the Netflix ones? I have. Okay. I mean, they had like Voltron Force, right? That's the that's the. But to me, like it's my childhood. It's it's yeah yeah yeah. It's the one from the '80s. That and if I if they start messing around with the characters from that, we're already off to a bad start. Yeah. Um, did you cast it? I did. I didn't, because I, I, I haven't even gotten a chance to sit down and really think about okay. it. Okay, you want me to hold mine? Not tell me. Okay, so I, like I said, I, I, I sat down and I said, okay, who, who, who could we get to play this? But I said, I'm only going to use the 1980s show as the basis point, as the re reference point for this. So I, and I, so my, I went back and actually looked a little bit at the 80s show. I think of the Voltron Force as a younger cast because the characters were drawn and shown as predominantly younger characters with the older sort of mentor um, in the show. Mm -hmm. So I came up with kind of a, a list, kind of went through a few things. So I'll give you my like quick rundown. So for Keith, who was the leader, I had Ty Sheridan, who you might know as he actually played Cyclops briefly in the um, new okay. X-Men show and was also the star of Ready Player One. That's probably where most people have seen him. But I don't okay. think of Keith as, Keith's not like a physically imposing, like super tough leader, right? He's noble, but he's kind of understated. So I like Sheridan, it's kind of, he's 25 by the way, the actor. So I kept, that's the thing. I only took actors that were in their twenties. I, I cut everyone off at 30. So that's the, I, I already, I, I may already know who you got for, was it Hunk? Was it? What, what, oh was yeah, I don't name? know if you know that. We'll see if you guess that. Okay. okay, anyway. So for Lance, I kind of went a little bit shock and I am trying to diversify the cast a bit. He kind of already did the role. Um, so I have John Boyega as Lance. Oh, that would be um, that, Just because I think Lance is more of the hothead in yeah, the crew yeah, like yeah, he's yeah, always yeah. wanting to go fight and and boyega was in pacific rim too which is not great but he's already shown he can drive one of these giant yeah, yeah, mechs yeah. before my favorite casting though is pidge my little man pidge with his glasses i want aiden gallagher number five from the umbrella academy i was i was about to i was thinking that but I'm like, this dude, he must has he has to be older now. <laughs> like he has to have glasses on. That's fine. <laughs> but that'll be that's a that's a dope cast. That's a dope. And he's cast. still he's 23, I think, in real life. So that okay. that would work. Um, so for hunk, I don't know if you're gonna like my hunk, but um, I actually went I actually went with um, Jacob Batalon from the Spider Verse. He's he's Ned in the Spider Man movies. That's what I was gonna tell you right there. It was oh, okay. <laughs> okay, that's what I was, I was hoping going. you would. I was hoping you would ask me. I could tell you, Ned. <laughs> okay, that's my guy. Yeah, so he's yeah, he's yeah. he's my hunk. So then yeah. I had a tough choice for Alora. Uh, I came down to two, so you can you can choose who you like best because they're very different tonally, but they're both in their mid twenties. So one is our gal Florence Pugh. I think could definitely rock this if she wanted to. Um, she okay. had to play it different. But, and then the other one I thought it was actually Anya Taylor-Joy, who was the star of Queen's Gambit, and who's actually gonna take over as young Furiosa um, from Charlize. Um, I think she's 27, I think. So that's who I also, because Valora is a strange character. Like she sort of comes off, she acts a little older, but then like she doesn't really look older than the, than the cast. Um, so I kind of, those are the two, she is blonde. So those are the two that I had for that. If you really wanted to go, I was thinking the girl from Game of Thrones. Um, Which one? 
she died. I think she was trying to warn everybody before she the before she blew up everybody. Um, she had she has like green eyes and red hair. Sophie uh, Turner? No. Oh. Um, the one that was supposed to marry Joffy. Okay. Oh, interesting. I don't know. I don't know if I know her name off the top of my head. So you, I, I'd have to look. Okay, it up. that could work. Um, that could work. Now, the other one, I if you wanted to go a totally different direction, since she's already playing royalty in a different sci-fi show, Zendaya could obviously do this if you wanted yeah. a different direction. But so that's um, so those are, that was my force, and then for the bad guys. Oh, and then I thought that, like, on principle, I can't forget his name, the old guy that mentors them. Yes. But I was sort of like, isn't this, like, isn't this what Liam Neeson has done, like, 27 times <laughs> in his career? Like, the soft-spoken, like, tall, majestic, like, old guy who knows everything? I'd so, probably get uh, Ian Glenn. Oh, yeah, there you go. Little 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 he's Bruce Wayne, Jorah Mormont, he yeah, could do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, he's perfect for that. So then for the bad guys, Lotor is tough because I think he, from a from an image standpoint, he basically looks like Orlando Bloom's Legolas. Like he has elf ears and like long, but but like in the show, Lotor is a really like harsh character. He has a big booming voice, like he's really rough. I don't think Orlando Bloom can do it. So I went with um, uh, Carl Urban from The Boys, Billy Butcher. That was, because he has the voice. He has, like, he has a rough edge voice. And especially if you go back way back when, when he was in the Lord of the Rings movies, he wears long hair really well. Um, now he might be a little older. Lotor, I don't know how old he's supposed to be in the series. Um, like he's not a kid, but that's who I had for that. Um, for which Hagar, since she's doing all the bucket list stuff in every franchise before she passes away, Helen Mirren to me is the obvious choice to do this if she would do it. Wow, that's a big name. Yeah, um, I mean, she's in the fast franchise, she's in Shazam. True. Like, you could get Helen Mirren right now, she would definitely do that. True. Um, and then for, for Zarkon, even though he's in. He's in a terrible movie right now, but I love him as a sinister guy and everything. Jared Harris. That's my guy. Jared, Jared Harris. Harris. What was he in? Um, so he was a star of Chernobyl, if you watch that show. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. He was in Mor he's in Mor Isn't he Morbius? He's in Morbius. As I said, yeah, he's in yeah, a terrible yeah, movie yeah, right yeah, now, yeah, but yeah, he's yeah, still, yeah, he's yeah, still yeah. one of my guys. He was um, Moriarty in uh, the Downey Sherlock Holmes. Yes, 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 yes. So yes, that was my Zarkon. So that was my cast. Okay. You can't afford that cast, but that's my cast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I sent you a link of the, the girl I was telling you about. Um, oh, Marjorie Tyrell. Okay. Natalie Dormer. Yeah, that'd yes. be a good one. She has a yeah. good look for that. I agree. Yeah. That's a yeah. good call. Yeah, man, we're, we're finally getting Voltron. Um, I can't wait to see what this is going to look like, man, because that's what this is going to look like is like, wow. This is a wow moment. This is a huge wow moment to see this finally being done live action. And if it looks anything like, um, uh, what was it called? Um, Pacific Rim? Yeah. Like, like, but is Voltron on a different planet? Yo, Avatar, look, oh my God, I, this, hey, I'm in, I'm in. Let us know in the comment section below if you're like us waiting for this movie to come out. Do you have some concerns because of the director? I think for me, and listen, let me just say this, because I know I've, 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 I've not had some great stuff to say about The Rock other than, you know, he is one of the most memorable wrestlers uh, ever. Um, he is where he is because he's a hard worker and he, and he wants, I, I think, you know, he, he, he's doing what he wants to do and there's nothing wrong with that, you know? Whether you like it or not, that's, that's up to you. Obviously, there's a lot of people that like what he does. I'm not a cons particularly a fan of a lot of the stuff that he does. Um, but he's earned the right to do what he wants. 
But when you're working with The Rock, who knows how how much of a a yes do we get for whatever decisions are made when you're working with him? You know what I'm saying? How much of it is your creative creativity? Yeah. How much of it is 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 Rock's uh, saying? I don't like this. Do it this way, and that's how it is going. That's how it's going to be. So let's see. Let's see. The uh, first but, teaser, though, my God, I'm um, gonna lose my mind. <laughs> we get that first teaser. Yeah, yeah, man. This is this is whatever year this movie is gonna come out. You best believe it's gonna be on my top ten most anticipated films oh, of it'll be whatever hot. year. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I, I, uh, I, I, they, they show me a teaser, and I just hear like, "I'll form the head." I'll be <laughs> fine. Yeah. Four blazing sword. <laughs> I know, right? I, I, wow, wow. Hopefully, it's not a street fighter. Hopefully, it's not a he man. Let's let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, and our final topic. Um, we gotta talk about um, yeah. this first um, episode of Moon Knight. This is a show that we've been looking very much forward to seeing. Um, we not a movie uh, show that we've been well, very much looking forward to seeing. Um, we've also said um, what this performance has to be in order for it to really work, and I think we're getting that, Brian, with this with this performance by Oscar Isaac, and uh, I really enjoy Ethan Hawke's um, character. Um, they're still yet to be to be to discover in that but oscar isaac's performance i say you you believe everything that you're feeling about the character you believe you believe is a loser you do start feeling sorry for him that sense that 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 drama towards the end that 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 suspense Mm -hmm. you felt it all the way and then, Brian, you just got to talk to me what you saw when you first saw this show. And uh, what was your reaction towards the performance of Oscar Isaac? And, and we'll also touch on um, Oscar Isaac only signed up for one season for this. He's not on a long term contract. So I want to talk about that as well. But what were your thoughts on this first episode of The Moon Knight? I enjoyed it. It raised more questions than answers, which I think is fine for a premiere. I am curious to find out as we go through, it's only six episodes, whether this will be another show where we feel like they should have released more than one to start because there's so many threads they're opening here that I, you know, but I think I was pretty on and sort of framing this as Marvel Shakespeare, just from the standpoint of Oscar Isaac, it, it really felt like a stage performance by right? somebody yes. who's trying to take you inside the mind of someone who's struggling with something and really having you live that, you know, through their day. And I thought he did a great job of the, the disorientation of shifting personas and his genuine sort of bewilderment at he seems completely crazy to you know the outsiders but like in his mind he's like no i'm completely convinced that what i'm doing makes sense and today's friday not sunday and Mm -hmm. and i I think he did a masterful job of that and i think the accent which drew a lot of controversy in the trailer really is an asset to that the accent fits the character fits the persona of stephen grant yes we clearly now know at least we've gotten hints that the mark specter voice is completely different and will be completely different. Mm-hmm. So the, the, so I think, you know, full marks to Isaac, I can see why he gravitated toward this role mm-hmm. uh, immediately. And I think from his perspective, the number one thing I want in the future episodes is it looks like we are going to experience this show from the vantage point of more than one of the personalities. I don't think we're going to live in Stephen Grant's shoes for six episodes because the the show very deliberately edited out everything that Mark Spector did. Yeah. So I'm assuming there'll be a moment in this show where we're going to be in Mark Spector's eyes and we'll see it that way. Yeah. Which I think is super cool. Like that's actually pretty original. That's one of the things that blew me away. Yes. Because I've read people that were like underwhelmed in the sense that 
oh, they cut away from all the good stuff. And I'm like, nah, I think they're setting you up to when they pivot to that, it has more impact. Of course. Brian, it's like, why are you guys finding stuff to complain about, yo? It's six episodes. This is the first episode. This is not a movie. There are other stuff. There are other things. It's just not this. It's not like they're not going to show it to you. Are you kidding me? Are you? Do you think we're not going to see the origin of what? Obviously, this has been happening from some for some time based on all the blue tape in the garbage can. This has been happening right. for some time now. They're going to show you how this all began. They can't do it all in one episode. People, stop complaining about stuff like this. It's, it's the first episode. And it was a, an amazing episode. If, if you just appreciate the performance and how they cut away from all those moments. Because I was like, damn, are they going to show us what happened? I know they're going to show it to you. They have to, Brian. I think it would be a big and a huge disappointment if it, they don't. And, but they've, they've shown us in um, several trailers now uh, some of that action. So people, stop complaining about little, these little things, man. I thought it was a brilliant performance by Oscar Isaac. So I like that. Ethan Hawke, I sent you a little more TBD. Now he gets the open, which was pretty cool. The very yeah. opening scene, pretty sinister as like, a, as like a cold lead into a new character. And you get a little bit of that sense, you know, that, that ominous sense when he's reading the woman you know, and then obviously she, she expi spoiler alert, she, she doesn't make it out of the scene. <laughs> but I think there's definitely a little bit of like, he's holding back, right? We're clearly not seeing his full arsenal and his full deck. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I mean, just given Hawk's caliber, I'm just fascinated to see when he turns that loose, what that actually looks like. But this episode for me was like, I walked out with like, a, with, with Oscar Isaac, it's like, he's already you know, kind of on display carrying scenes. Hawk was much more reserved. He's more of a yes. presence. Yes. And I think we would, um, for me, that's why he was a little bit more of a, of a TBD. Um, now, what, now you did text me and we, we agreed on this. Now, what did you think of the action and the VFX? Because I think we both had a little bit of, that was probably our, like a little bit of concern over, here, over what was happening here. The VFX, especially during the chase was a bit, Jumanji for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it wasn't quite there. Um, but I, I sort of ignored it because, because, you know, if I had to point, you know, if I, and I pointed out stuff from great stuff like the Mandalorian when them two mm -hmm. were riding in their bikers and talking regular, like there's no, like it's not loud or something like that. That was, I was thrown off. So I, there, there's, you know, there's moments where stuff like this throws me off because it just doesn't either A, look good or the continuity or it just doesn't make sense. So these are one of the things that, that it just didn't look that believable or great um, when or how they did it, but whatever. Hopefully it gets better. And because some of this stuff is at night, who knows, that might make it look a little better. I don't know, Brian. But um, it's one of it's just one of those things. What are your thoughts? What were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I had the same reaction, which was it wasn't quite as tight as some of like you know like I think the the, the Loki visuals are kind of impeccable start to finish. Like I, I didn't think this quite was on that level. Um, I was okay, like as we've seen in the trailer, like Moon the Moon Knight persona looks okay to me. I think I'm, we haven't really seen it as much in action. The scene we got was really the scene that was in the trailer, so it's not really that new. Yeah. Um, but it looked fine, like you know, seeing seeing it on, on screen. The um, the this, I guess the scene is, is the scene that's supposed to be with Kanchu, effectively, like where he's in the hallway. Um, that was decent. Like I mean, yeah. it, it, that was definitely evoking a little bit of the horror genre that they seem to be wanting to go for. That's probably the closest we got, I thought, to that. Um, I was surprised as much of this episode took place during the day as it did. Mm -hmm. To be quite honest, like there was a lot of sunlight. There was a lot of like open air. I was expecting a little more of the Batman style of like it's nighttime and, and that, that stuff's happening in the dark. 
Um, but that may be a setup. Like I said, it could be that's Stephen Grant's a daytime guy, right? And so that's why we got daytime. So I, so I don't know. Where did you feel about the, the premise that we got that this was going to be because they're the ones who told us it was going to be so dark and it was going to be horror and it was going to put, I don't know that we fully got that unleashed in this episode. So where are you at with regard to, to that piece of the equation? Uh, I still, I think is um, still to be determined based on what this, because obviously um, Stephen Grant is not a violent guy and he doesn't do everything that's necessary. We're not going to see the graphic uh, violence because he's not the one delivering it. Uh, for the most part, he's the one on the receiving end. And when he turns is where you get the violence. And I think that's where we we'll have to sort of really ask the question uh, of how violent this is or how edgy this is. How did you feel about the voice in the head? Cause I did text now they, they, you know, Venom has existed as on screen before they wrote and developed this show. So they knew they were treading into that neighborhood. Did you feel like of it course. was that they were like, how do you feel about the comparison? How do you feel about the parallels to that idea? Listen, when I first saw it, I, I well, heard it. It felt, uh, it reminded me of Venom. Um, they got a, a great actor to do it too. He was in yeah, F. Murray uh, Abraham. Scarface, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's the, so that's one thing that's different, right? So in Venom, it's Tom Hardy voice edited talking to yeah. Tom Hardy. In this, yeah. it's two different people, but correct. Yeah. Um uh, listen, I think Oscar Isaac's performance overshadowed a lot of stuff for me. That doesn't really bother me. Uh, I don't know how often we're going to see that interaction. Um, certainly not to the degree of Venom. Um, so it doesn't bother me too much. Um, and if the fact that it sounds a little bit different, but still reminds me of it, uh, you know, it doesn't bother me that much. Yeah, the, I mean, the Venom one is played, honestly, in, in Let There Be Carnage, the Venom one is played more slapsticky. I mean, there's definitely more of like a, almost a comedic undertone to their, yeah. his interaction with the symbiote. This is definitely not that. Yeah. Um, but it is also a gimmick that I think you have to be a little careful with, like not to over, like, I realize they want to take you inside the mind of someone who's struggling with this sort of, you know, mental health issue, but you don't want to overuse that trope, I don't think, in, in these episodes. So mm -hmm. I think it would be, I'll be interested to see, given it is F. Murray Abraham, like how much did they sign him to actually say and, and do? Yeah. Out of all the Disney Plus shows, was this the best debut? The best first episode? No, Loki's still better. I mean, Loki's still better than this. Um, I was trying to think what the... Oh, yeah, MCU shit, right? We're not putting the Mandalorian, because Mandalorian season one no, is no, no, better no, than no. this, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, I still, I still think it would, Loki would be the best premiere. This is, this is better. I mean, I, like, I struggled a lot with the first couple episodes of WandaVision, so I definitely, this is easier to jump into, I felt like, than, than yeah, that. Yeah. Um, I think I might have enjoyed this one actually even a little bit more than Falcon, just because it was different. It was a little more different, yeah, um, than the Falcon one was. So, yeah, I might, I might, maybe it's in that number two, number three spot behind behind Loki. I mean, where is it for you? Um, I think it's behind Loki for me. Yeah. Um, you know what's interesting is my wife was asked asking really good questions so i know she's into it uh so, so she was asking sort of the same questions is is this only happening in his head is this really happening um and she's excited to see what happened in between those those transformations when he's at that 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 um i guess certain death and then he's he changes and something happens where he's out of it so we're, she's definitely interested. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see if your wife will give it a shot and see what she will. I, I think anybody watching this for the first time will be curious and want to watch. Just keep on continue watching. She thought the trailers looked 
not interesting. So yeah, I'll have to tell her that it's good and different. <laughs> uh, and sell her on Oscar Isaac and Ethan Hawke, I think, to, to get her involved in it. But uh, I might wait a little bit deeper in the show before kind of trying to trying to rope her in. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of uh, the first episode of Moon Knight and Oscar Isaac's uh, performance. Man, I, I really, really enjoyed his performance. It'll be interesting, Brian. What do you think? about Oscar Isaac signing on only on for this 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 um season but already we're hearing talks of a possible season two so what do you think is going on well the cynic in me says that nobody in Hollywood has been searching for a franchise more than Oscar Isaac <laughs> so if this thing hits I'm not concerned about him signing up for season two Hey, yeah, and being a part of the the grander yeah. scheme of things, and popping up Come in on, the movies, man. and yeah, I think, on, I man. think, yeah, you you can't. Vanity is definitely my favorite sin. If you've ever watched Devil's Advocate, he's he, who, who's not going who who's not going to want to see travel the world and be known all around the world. Perhaps maybe not for him. You know, who knows he probably he's probably having those same feelings that chris evans had before he chose captain america he said like yo this is gonna make me big yo i don't want to be i don't want to be that you know but he did it and um oscar Isaac, i think is done definitely gonna do it. he's gonna probably talk to reach out to chris evans see how he dealt with all of this i guess but i'm um, just saying like this is a guy who was apocalypse right like this this is a guy who was in star wars like he's Right, he's not. Yeah. He he had he's he he knows enough about this this ball game at this point. He's looking what he's looking for is a hit. That he's looking for a hit in this big world. That I think in his mind, because he isn't he's an Academy Award caliber actor, he's looking to have that franchise that you know makes his name and makes his bank, so that he can then go do inside Lewell and Davis and those type of movies as well. That's what a lot of actors want. But yeah. I think the fact that he's he's been a part of some franchise stuff that hasn't worked probably made him a little more cautious, right? He's like, I'm interested. I like this. Let's see how it rolls before I sign up for two, three seasons and five five movie appearances or whatever they're going to try to hook him for. So. Yeah. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that's our show for today. Um, please let us know in the comment section below what you thought of any of these topics that we discussed. Please keep you know keep listening to the Nerd Jam Report. We be we're not we're not we're not you know professionals in any sense of the world or any, trying to be journalists we're just talking about some of the stuff that's happening and speculating on what could happen or should happen um and let us know in the comments if you agree brian any last words yeah so my last word is 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 um a little bit humorous but um it's not in the category of shows that we would discuss but i've been trying to get my seven-year-old daughter into the superhero genre and she scares easily quite honestly so a lot of the cartoons that you and i love are probably a little bit too intense for her just yet so just the just the unlimited batman the animated series x-men like she's not ready for those yet i want her to appreciate those when we get there so i've been looking for this entry point to get her involved in the genre and i finally found it on disney plus Spidey and His Amazing Friends is a fantastic oh, yeah. intro show for younger kids to get to know superheroes. They finally, someone finally took basically the idea of Paw Patrol and PJ Masks and just changed it into the Marvel Universe. I love the show. It's one season, 17 episodes. She's literally watched all 17 in one oh, weekend because wow. she's so hooked on it. And the, the, the Spider Man and the Amazing Friends from back in the day? No, there's a new one. It came out in the past 12 months. It's called really? Spidey and His Amazing Friends. It stars Peter Parker, Miles Morales, and Gwen Stacy as a spider trio. It's Spider-Man. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Miles is spin, but it's him in his colors. And then Spider-Gwen is ghost spider, but it's her. She's got her hood, looks everything yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. And they go around and they take on a kid version of Green Goblin, Doc Ock, Rhino, and they get help from Black Panther, Hulk, 
there's Marvel. The show is great for ki for kids who yeah. who are just starting out. You don't yeah. want the hardcore action yet. You kind of want something to just get them involved. But it touched off an entire car ride of Q and A about <laughs> Dad. What's vibranium? Dad, <laughs> how did Hulk become green? Which led to my kid having the one of the most fun like simplistic. Rep she goes, Dad. So it seems like a lot of these characters, they're brilliant somebodies who something, an accident happens to them and some of them wind up good and some of them wind up bad. I said, that's it, that's the whole genre, you're good. You're caught up. 75 years of material, we're, we're there. How old is she again? Seven, she's hooked. She's my, in. my son, he's three and he's watching that. Wow, that's awesome. And, and and when we when I'm watching the real stuff, he's like, "Hey, that's Spider Man." I'm like, "Yep, that's Spider Man." But you can't watch this. Get out of here. Uh, but he, you know, he's still in his world watching, you know, kid stuff. But he definitely watches that show very often, so he knows the characters, which is right. great. Um, that's our show. Thank you for joining us once again. Please hit that like and subscribe button um hit that notification bell share with your friends and comment in the comment section below um starting now next nerd gen report i'm going to start casting we're going to have a quick discussion and i'm going to start casting each of the x-men just one per show oh, as okay. many as i can do that that'll be the topic of discussion that'll probably be the first topic of discussion so um, next next time we talk, uh, I'm gonna have a cast for Cy Cyclops, and you tell me your your cast, and we'll get into a quick discussion about that. But that's our show. We'll see you next time on the Nerd Gym Report.